Continuamos la sesión de esta mañana eh, con la profesora Sheila Folliot, que es profesora emérita de Historia del Arte en la Universidad George Mason, donde ejerció de profesora en las clases de Arte y Cultura Europea en los siglos XV de los siglos 15 al XVIII. Actualmente es catedrática de los departamentos de Historia y de Historia del Arte. En su trayectoria investigadora, que pueden encontrar a través de numerosas publicaciones y conferencias en diferentes eh, formatos, se centra en el estudio desde de, eh, el género del patronazgo y la relación de las artes con las mujeres del Renacimiento, prestando especial atención a la figura de Catalina de Medici, sobre la que nos hablará ahora en su actual conferencia. Les pido pues, un aplauso y... Oh. <risa> Muchas gracias al Museo y Proyecto Mefer por haberme honorado con una invitación a participar en este seminario. Pero lo siento mucho que mi español hablado o escrito no esté todavía a un nivel que haga justicia a mi audiencia, audiencia Augusto, eh, con su permiso, hablará en inglés. <laughs> uh, at the Ornadas in Murcia last April, I explored some issues relating to the place of metals in Renaissance attitudes about the historical accuracy of portraits. Starting from the example of Lyon-based Guillaume Ruyer's Promptuaire des Médailles, published in 1553 in Latin, French, and Italian editions, with the addition of a later Spanish edition dedicated to Don Carlos, whom I now know, thanks to Anne-Marie Jordan, was an avid collector of coins. In the context of medals and early modern women, at that meeting, I especially considered the significance of Rouillet's dedicating this book to two women. The French edition on the screen to Marguerite de Valois, daughter of Francis I and future Duchess of Savoy, pictured here, and the Italian to Queen Catherine de Medici. And thanks to those knowledgeable about numismatics attending those jornadas, Paloma, <laughs> uh, for their comments, which I hope uh, have set me on a more profitable path. Today, I will probably be raising more questions than trying to answer them, but I figure this is a good group to try things out on. So I shall further consider this book and related sources to highlight both the importance of Lyon and environs as a literary and publishing center, and how Ruyer's work informed Nicolas Houel, the Paris-based author of the long manuscript L'Histoire de la Reine Artemise, 1562, dedicated to Catherine de Medici, with accompanying illustrations, primarily by Antoine Caron, that as I and others have argued, while presenting itself as royal pedagogy, provided an imagery of power when Catherine governed as regent for her son Charles IX, then age 10, in a France increasingly torn apart by religious wars and political factions. Numismatics, whether coins, metal, or jetons, figure prominently in Uwell's and his contemporary sense of what constitutes historical evidence. Rouillet's Promptuaire appears among the sources that Uwell consulted. You can see the list there. And he has taken Rouillet's premise, as articulated by Francis Haskell, to heart that in the early modern era, medallic portraits were regarded as authoritative. Then I'll turn to some other literary works emerging from the Lyon ambiance, as well as aspects of Catherine de' Medici and her numismatic imagery, a topic explored also by one of Noelia's students, Tereme Morenilla. 
Although art historians tend to apply the term metal or medai or medaia to portrait metals produced in the main by well-regarded sculptors, most Renaissance texts use the term metal generically, referring both to what we now have been talking about, portrait metals, as well as ancient or modern coins, or even jetons, the tokens used for counting that carried personal and propagandistic messages. Ouel's overall vision for his Histoire d'Artemis Ensemble was ambitious. He proposed that illustrations accompanying his text serve as models for tapestries that Queen Catherine could deploy as a validating backdrop. And he provides examples of how metals, broadly defined, feature in the life of his ancient prototype. The drawings are framed with Catherine's heraldry, devices, and mottos. In the central portion of this drawing by Antoine Caron, relating to Artemisia's role commissioning what would become the famous funerary monument to her husband Mausolus, the mausoleum, the queen sits at the head of a table regarding a plan, accompanied and as his text and an explanatory sonnet that would have been put in that blank space at the bottom, explains by artists and astrologers summoned to collaborate in the task. This presumably idealizes Catherine's own patronage of the tomb for her deceased husband, Henri de at Wright, and herself, incidentally, in planning since 1559. Well, moreover, specified that the experts not only proposed a plan to the queen, they also calculated the expense down to the last penny. Catherine was constantly criticized for spending money. In the background at another table, a detail at left, men busily calculate using jetons, tokens representing various values placed on a board dividing into sections, a method employed in antiquity and still in use actually in Renaissance France as illustrated in a contemporary jeton from Nuremberg. And by the way, since we're in Spain, I thought it worth mentioning that the earliest dated French jeton was made for Queen Blanche of Castile in 1226 when she was regent, and you see a drawing of it there. In another episode from the series, Artemisia places the first stone of the mausoleum's foundations. It was, as we heard from Davide, an ancient practice that was repeated in the Renaissance, and medals were placed in foundations, as we know from the example of Sigismondo Malatesta, who had rep medals representing himself and Isotte degli Atti embedded into the Tempo Malatestiano in Rimini. Caron depicts a container full of medals in the foreground, while others are poured into the area where the queen is at work. In one stanza of the sonnet Uel composed to fit into the space at the bottom of the frame, Uel described what is occurring. The nobility, seeing all the progress, threw in with the lime, the sand, and the matter of the foundations an entire largesse of metals of the king, which recount according to life his facial lines. He's quite specific here. These are portrait medals or coins of the king. Guillaume Rouillet was a printer based in Lyon, a city with a strong Italo-French axis, which was also a hotbed for thinking and publication on topics relating to antiquity intended to appeal to Renaissance audiences. Humanists looking for patronage hoped the books they composed and dedicated would please a potential supporter. Gabriele Simeone, is an example of someone showing off his antiquarian knowledge to sponsors he sought, among them his fellow Florentine, Caterina de' Medici. 
Note his flowery and conventional dedication there at the top of this page. He played on the fact that her mother's family had possessed significant land holdings in the Auvergne to expound on significant aspects of the region's history in his 1568 description of the Limagne, which is a large plateau in today's Massif Central near Clermont-Ferrand. As seen in the map, he drew at left and a modern map there in the center, which I've had to switch to get the orientation to correspond. And of course, Lyon is also in the vicinity here. To bolster his text's authority, the title page at right emphasizes his having discovered and drawn from various sources, especially artifacts, first among them, medaille. Simeone illustrates, surely with his dedicatee in mind, a Roman coin with a portrait of Empress Sabina with Juno on the reverse. Juno was frequently invoked as a prototype for at least elite Renaissance consorts, and the Getty Museum has an enamel allegory of Catherine de' Medici as Juno, riding her chariot with a rainbow. The rainbow, signifying peace, was the key motif in one of Catherine's devices. It was sometimes personified as Iris, who served as Juno's handmaiden. Simeone compiled another book specifically about metals, the Illustrazione degli Epitaphi e Medaglie Antiche, Lyon, 1558. In it, he illustrated a portrait medal that he claims to have seen of Laura. The love interest, whether actual or fantasy, to whom Petrarch addressed sonnets that have greatly influenced the way in which Renaissance women were seen and described. J.B. Trapp and Karen Simroth James have analyzed this aspect of Simeone's book. According to Lyon publisher Jean de Tourne, editor of the first French edition of Petrarch's Canzonieri in 1545, that poet, of course, had spent years in the area around Avignon, same general area of France. And it was Maurice Sève, a Lyonnais poet and would-be heir to Petrarch, who was present at the discovery of Laura's tomb in 1553. As de Tourne described the occasion, initially nothing was found except earth and tiny bones, but near an intact jaw lay an iron box bound shut by a copper wire which you, Sev, he's, he's um, addressing the poet here, immediately opened, discovering within it a sheet that was folded and sealed with green wax and a bronze medal with a miniature figure of a lady on one side and nothing on the other, which lady seemed to be spreading her dress open over her breasts with her two bare hands to display her broken heart. And surrounding her, there were four letters only, M, L, M, I, which everyone tried his best to explain. And in the conventions of the time, of course, a nobleman had to be present in the group, and the nobleman was the one to figure out or propose a solution to the inscription, Madonna Laura Morta Yace. Here lies the dead Madonna Laura. Francis I, en route to Marseille in 1553, coincidentally to welcome Clement VII Medici, who traveled there to officiate at the marriage of the French king's second son, Henri, to the Pope's grandniece, Catherine, stopped by to view the recent discovery as reimagined by a 19th century artist at Wright. No Laura medal exists, 
But the very fact that her presumed portrait was in this medium cannot is so noteworthy th for thinking about the significance of medallic portraits of Renaissance women. Now to turn to some medallic imagery connected with Catherine de' Medici herself, discussed in relative chronological order. Jetons seem hardly studied beyond their cataloging. Like coins and metals, jetons have two surfaces with the potential to carry images, and they can be revealing about relationships, special occasions, and changes in status. This brass example bears an obverse inscription, Catherine Duchesse d'Orléans, surrounding a shield with simplified Orléans and Medici arms. The reverse carries the inscription Madeleine et Marguerite fille du roi with the arms of France within a lozenge, generally indicating unmarried females. Heraldry represents individuals here rather than portraiture. Nevertheless, important information is conveyed. Catherine became Duchesse d'Orléans on her marriage to Henri in 1533. Her sisters-in-law, Madeleine and Marguerite, were then unmarried, the former marrying the King of Scotland in 1537. In 1536, the court visited Lyon, where resident painter Corneille portrayed Catherine and Madeleine wearing dress resembling that worn by Francis I's second queen, Leonore of Austria. So this jeton might well have been struck to commemorate that occasion. Another jeton records Catherine's transition to Dauphine, achieved in 1536, that carried also the dignity of Duchess of Brittany. So here she's represented as Catherine, Dauphine, and Duchess of Brittany, Brita Dukis. Indicative, of her increased significance as future queen, her arms have been elaborated to include her mother's distinguished French ancestry, the counts of the Tour d'Auvergne and Boulogne. The reverse displays a wheel, doubtless a reference to her namesake, namesaint, also a princess, Catherine of Alexandria, who was subjected to this torture device as seen in Durer's woodcut. Apparent is the inscription confundantur et non confundatur, let them be confused and I won't be. Its source is the book of Jeremiah, where the context is more along the lines of, let them be confounded who persecute me an intriguing puzzle possibly alluding to growing religious dissent or personal enmities. A jeton dated 1558 features Catherine's arms with a conventional inscription inserting her being queen, which happened in 1547. The reverse displays her device, a rainbow over a somewhat stormy sea with a Greek inscription translating good hope triumphs over hardship, a new motto adopted upon her achieving this status. When she arrived as a young duchess, Catherine's device instead had cast her as Iris with the motto emphasizing the rainbows bringing peace and light, carrying both ancient and religious resonances. As well as elaborating a persona with a combination of portrait and motto, the potential in medallic art for complementary messages joined together could be employed to proclaim connections between people. In portrait medals, we've seen combinations of royal spouses or fathers and children, uh, mothers and daughters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This jeton proclaims the affiliation between 
Queen Catherine and a key household office holder, Philibert de la Chambre de Savoie. Inscriptions define their roles. She is queen, he is premier écuyer, literally stable master, but his, uh, his office also saw transport and processions and things like that, and you probably know she was constantly on the road. This was a major office, in other words. Catherine's name pertaining to the commissioning of medals does not occur in any records that I have read in secondary sources. I will admit to not having combed archives or anything like that that probably needs doing. So could such a jeton have been ordered by either party? She as a gift for him to circulate or he to accent his own status and position? Turning to what we now more readily liken to other art forms, Catherine does appear in several portrait medals. But as just stated, her direct role in any commissions remains obscure. This lead single-sized medal in poor condition depicts Catherine conventionally in profile and the inscription asserts her status as queen Therefore, it should date between 1547 and 59. But being precise about dating medals is tricky, as some were restruck over the years, even quite recently, for collectors. No extant drawing is precisely parallel to the composition, but her head, as seen in a print from a series depicting 16th century monarchs, suggests a common prototype. This drawing after Clouet, creator of most French court portraits in these years, typifies the French preference for portraits in three-fourths view. The metal and print retain the forward-facing pose, pose of her shoulders, but turn her head in profile. And I think we've seen in other presentations how this is a common kind of formal issue that medalists are dealing with. The medals of Anne de Bretagne and Louise of Savoie, made at the turn of the century, present their subjects in strict profile. Catherine's pose more closely resembles a medal of Leonor of Austria, probably made for a Habsburg context that modifies the position, with head and neck in profile, but shoulders in three-quarter view. Catherine and her husband, Henri II, occupy opposite sides of a 1555 medal made by Étienne de Lonne, who worked for a brief period at the Paris Mint and eventually became a highly esteemed court goldsmith. The inscription extolling the king's military prowess and dedication to his country suggests its having been made during the wars between Charles V and Henri, and the latter's portrait seems much more lively, while Catherine, fully in profile, seems conventional and derivative. In 1559, Henri II died accidentally in a ceremonial joust, and his eldest son, François II, succeeded him. He, in turn, died the following year, and as his successor, Charles IX, was 10 years old, a regency was required, and Catherine, who had served in that capacity while Henri was at war, resumed the post. This medal, attributed to engraver Antoine Bruchet, places the new king on what the British Museum website designates the reverse, although its photo in the, on the website is placing it on the left, which is usually the place for the obverse, I thought, uh, replicating the appearance of his father in the earlier medal, as well as on the obverse where Catherine also appears. So I wonder really, and we discussed this a little bit at the Jornadas, which side is the obverse, which side is the reverse, and does that matter? Does that say something important that we need to take into account? Isn't it more likely that the ruler would take precedence? 
even though the inscriptions seem to indicate that you need to acknowledge the parents first. As we can see, Catherine is now attired as a widow, a point to which I shall return. A very small medal now in the museum in Lyon presents an interesting puzzle. The material is gold, but the craftsmanship is, shall I call it, rather primitive? Her appearance here relates somewhat to earlier Clouet portraits, like this drawing of 1550 at center, and the inscription on the reverse records that it was given to her by the city of Avignon, and a similar one, top right, features Charles IX and also refers to Avignon. Well, they went to Avignon in, uh, in the 1560s, so it makes sense that this was a gift. Then, but where did the image design for the small metal come from? A wood carver named Georges Reverdy made a woodcut imitating a metal based surely on a Clouet prototype to illustrate Catherine's biography in Rouillet's Promptuaire, published in Lyon in 1553, before any securely dated portrait medals of Catherine, extant or recorded, had been made. You see it at left. Rouillet's book is populated with woodcuts seen here on the bottom in examples from the 1561 Spanish edition that suggest that they reproduce actual metals or coins, somewhat like the book that Davide showed of you know, ancient Roman emperors in coin portraits, whether or not such metals actually existed. And some of these portraits are related to metals, others not. By the time Catherine visited Lyon, I mean Avignon in 1564, Reverdy's would-be medallic portrait, I would assert, had assumed sufficient authority to inspire the local craftsman to base his medal on it. And a woodcut at right made after it to record it as part of an 18th century collection kind of keeps the same formal vocabulary uh, that the earlier woodcuts from the Renaissance did. To prop up the young king's ruling authority, Catherine planned an ambitious trip around France to present the young King Charles IX to his subjects, and Avignon was one of their stops. A major destination was Bayonne, where lavish festivities recorded in the Valois tapestries greeted important Spanish visitors, including King Charles' sister, Queen Isabel. Catherine presumably needed something to present to dignitaries they would encounter on this trip, and metal engraver Guillaume Martin produced this silver gilt medal dated 1565, which we've just seen, based on the composition of that of 1560, but with important differences. The king retains his costume, but the reverse now features Catherine's portrait alone. Henri's a thing of the past. While she no longer wears elaborately embroidered clothing or jewelry, she appears elongated into a much more regal pose with elegant drapery swirls and a clearer definition of her features. I mean, she's elegant without trappings. It's something widows wanted to have it both ways, right? The inscriptions are conventional. He the most Christian king and she the widow of one king and mother of two others with one important addition. Caleb. In the Renaissance, this adjective was more often applied to males in what we saw in Davide's talk, the Piero della Francesca diptych of the Duke and Duchess of Urbino, where it applied to him, but certainly not to her. If Catherine has 
Caleb uh, attached to her, I would argue this is a very bold move indeed. Her new image appeared in other metals and oriented differently, sometimes this way, sometimes that way. Here adopted by engraver Niccolo Nelli for a collection of prints representing European monarchs published in 1568 which also included Nelly's similarly adapted portrait after Jacopo da Trezzo's medal of Mary I. Is it simply easier to copy a profile portrait from another graphic medium, or does this further emphasize the iconic and authoritative nature of numismatic imagery? Catherine's same profile reappears on a medal made after 1574, whose reverse acknowledges the fact of yet another new king, Henri III, at the top, previously elected Polish sovereign, with the portraits of her other two sons to have ruled below. Her inscription emphasizes her role as their pious mother, appropriate in the context of the religious wars then raging in France. What we might consider her most artistically ambitious portrait is Germain Pilon's Uniface work of 1573 to 75, existing in several examples. Pilon had recently been appointed to head the Paris Mint, and documents confirm his being appreciated there for his artistic talent. He had also worked extensively as a large-scale sculptor at the French court, significant on Catherine's, significantly on Catherine's own commission for the tomb of Henri II and herself, which you saw earlier. That monument featured three different portrayals of the queen made over time. So Pilon was certainly familiar with her physiognomy, or at least her desires, for different rhetorics of representation. When compared with the contemporary medal with her three sons on the reverse, which you see on the top there, and especially that relating to the Avignon visit, we can immediately notice differences in scale. I've tried to reproduce these in the actual scale relationship that they are. Pinon's greatest innovation here is the break with the medallic tradition to depict Catherine in the three-quarter view that presented much more of a technical challenge in rendering the depth of relief required while replicating the favorite view seen in pa the painted portraits of the Valois court. Pilon, moreover, draws from an image made some 12 to 15 years before, early in the queen's widowhood. And although some later portraits of Catherine were made, he immortalizes her around age 40. That's also, I think, a familiar theme of these queens. Elizabeth, for example, of England. So we must be dealing here with a portrait medal meant for prominent display in an interior setting where no reverse imagery was required. I mean, we're not dealing with something that you hand around, right? During these same years, the 1570s, Nicolas Houel, author of the Histoire d'Artemise and compiler of the related drawings, was engaged in another venture. At one time, this drawing at center, featuring Catherine's portrait in round, surrounded by allegorical figures, was associated with the Artemisia series, but now it is related instead to Uel's other project. Rather than deploying an ancient prototype to represent current events, he proposed instead the Histoire Française de Notre Temps, a combination of illustrations and sonnets celebrating the Valois reigns, contemporary history. Catherine's portrait, undoubtedly by another hand, possibly Clouet himself or someone from his workshop because it's tipped in to the drawing, has been added, note, in a round central frame. 
When viewed in the context of the whole drawing, it resembles the frontispiece as of published books, and just there's one example of a French one on the left. I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with these lavish frontispieces with portraits and lots of allegorical figures. But frontispiece derived from the Latin in 16th century France were originally applied to architecture, denoting the principal entry of a building. And even when adapted to introduce a book, the overall composition retains its architectural character. Placing a portrait in a niche or set off space above a structure upon which allegorical figures recline is a commonplace of monumental Renaissance tombs. Notably, that of Catherine's father, Lorenzo Duke of Urbino, which Michelangelo and his assistants were pulling together in precisely the years the young Catherine spent her final days in Florence before leaving for France. Note that her portrait takes a circular format, deriving again from the cloué types that also inspired Reverdi and Pilon. Are there, although there are not many monumental tombs to elite women from this period, I've noticed several that display portraits of the deceased specifically within circular frames. That's just one example on the right. All these forms seek to immortalize. Monumental tombs occupy fixed positions and their material components announce their permanence in no uncertain terms. But portraits in multiples, like those in or intended for publication in books and medals, can circulate and spread that immortality to a wider audience. The Mayfair Project is addressing the understudied topic of women and medals. To appreciate medals' full impact, we must also keep aware of the wider context in which metals operated, not just in themselves as objects to be given, collected, received, studied, and admired, but also how their nature as circular images carrying multiple resonance informed artistic production in other media. Thank you.